I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to thank all of you for coming this evening. Go ahead and call the roll. Trustee Sperling? Here. Trustee Lee? Here. Trustee Hines? Yay. Trustee Youngerman? Here. Trustee Marisick? Here. Trustee Bond? Here. And we're all here. Thank you. Move on to uh, public participation. We have, uh, first we have the public comment period, which is the two-minute opportunity for any member of the public that's here today to address the board on any issue. All right, hearing none, move on to uh, Kane County regarding Montgomery Road Phase 1 study. With that, I'll invite you guys up to the podium. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Debbie's got one. Hi, my name is Jennifer O'Connell. I'm here representing the Kane County Department of Transportation. Last year, we selected a HDR as our engineering consultant to help us with the phase one engineering studies for Montgomery Road. And Jordan Taylor is here with us this evening from HDR to give us a presentation on the progress that we've made after three stakeholder focus groups and a lot of engineering studies so far. Do you think you could go uh, full screen with that? I think you just click from beginning at the top there. I'll go up one. Up Underneath the file up there? Oh. Boom one. Oh. There you go. Okay. So this is basically, this is the presentation that we, um, we gave on May 21st. We sat down with some of the uh, members of the village uh, to gain some opinion or perspective on the project and to kind of inform and advise. Um, I'm going to briefly go through the background, uh, I'm going to go through it fairly quick, so if there's any questions, just stop me and, and ask, and I'll try to answer it the best I can. Uh, the real goal here is to get through to the, uh, the actual design of the roadway. There is an outstanding uh, option, a couple of options, so what we're here uh, to do is to kind of seek the opinion or perspective of the village. Uh, we didn't feel that we were the best representatives to pick some of the parts of the project um, because there were multiple options that could sway either way. And we felt that the community's opinion would have been better for our selection. So, um, do I have to point it somewhere? No, it's coming off of that laptop. Let me see if it appears to be on. It says it's on. Ah. I, I was doing that. Oh. <laughs> well, maybe you can just moderate for me then. Um, so this is the timeline. Uh, we started the project, the phase one study, in 2013. Uh, June of 2013, we got notice to proceed. We moved forward. We collected data. Uh, we did our investigation research in order to start uh, developing some sort of design for the project. We also had a public meeting, which we recorded public comments. Um, we kind of gave a, an informational uh, view of how the process works, how long it's going to take, uh, what's involved, and, uh, and get the public's opinion in the local community. Um, then we moved to, oh, go back, sorry, for one second. Uh, so then we moved to um, developing our, our alternative analysis. So we developed different alternatives for the roadway. We want to uh, try to tackle every angle and come up with different options because there's multiple things that we can solve. and and we shouldn't just look at one individual option. Then we'll move to uh, 
the preferred alternative, which is what we want to come to today. We want to find the, the one alternative that we can move towards the end of the design process and go into phase two. When that's done, we'll, like I said, we'll further the design, we'll do environmental analysis, drainage analysis, finish with a project development report, and seek design approval from IDOT and FHWA. And then hopefully phase two in 2016. We started out existing conditions. Uh, we investigated, did research on the, the roadway. What was wrong with the roadway? What did we need to fix? There was uh, in, insufficient infrastructure, overcapacity, just a, a lot of traffic volumes throughout the, the peak hour and throughout the day. Uh, more, uh, a, a larger facility that can handle that capacity was needed according to those numbers. Uh, there were some substandard geometric designs, uh, sharp curves, uh, sight distance, things like that. Turning movements, there was a lot of comments from the public meeting that people couldn't turn off and on of the, the roadway due to traffic in the, in the opposing direction. They couldn't exit their properties or businesses. Um, there was comments for limited pedestrian bicycle amenities. They, the, the, the residents were asking for more sidewalks, uh, safer sidewalks, because there's a large segment that it, there is no where for pedestrians to walk. Um, and of course, lack of drainage. So multiple comments on flooding, drainage problems, and deficiencies. Get the next, please. Like I said, in the public meeting, we, we recorded comments. Uh, it was kind of a, a, a research investigation. What was wrong? What do we need to solve? That helps us figure out what design options to use. What what way to design the roadway. Um, just, I've just listed m a, uh, just a bunch of the, uh, the comments from the public. But you can go next, please. So we had a, uh, a stakeholder focus group meeting. So we, we asked uh, people from the public meeting and the surrounding community if they would like to be in this stakeholder focus group meeting in which people would come, listen to us, uh, basically give the spiel of the, the roadway and they would be involved in uh, developing more alternatives and also giving us a more opinion, more public involvement uh, with respect to what we do with the roadway. And takeaways from the first meeting, we had two alternatives, new alternatives that the group uh, came up with and, uh, and basically uh, uh, narrowed down to what our focal points would be. What do we need to solve? Next, please. These were the attendees at the stakeholder focus group meeting. The second meeting, we did an evaluation of those alternatives. So after the first one, we went back and we refined and we, we looked at them from a design and evaluation standpoint and came back with our findings, showed that to the, the group. Uh, the group then had time to work together, to discuss, to eliminate alternatives. Um, takeaways from that meeting, uh, the east end, which is the majority of the roadway, uh, the preferred alternative for that section was selected or was preferred. They, they came to a conclusion that that one was preferred over the, the second option, which we'll get into later in the slides. Um, and then three alternatives for the west end were eliminated and two were carried forward, which we'll also get into those couple of alternatives at the end of the presentation. Next, please. And then just a like informational purposes, there's a lot of environmental impacts along the roadway, so we have to take these into account. These are things that can, uh, can extrapolate the schedule, can increase the cost of the roadway, but when we look at these things, these can also be determining factors on which alternatives we pick. And based on our, our, our alternatives, uh, they, were, they were affected by all of them, so it really came down to no elimination due to, uh, due to one effect over the other. The alternatives, so I have an aerial there. I don't know if you can see it. I, I, I apologize, it's a little dim. Uh, but if you look on the right side, there's Hill Avenue. Um, and it, it goes to the west, down Montgomery Road, through this S-curve area to the, to the river. And then that's where we are in the Village Hall across the river. The east end goes from the from Hill Avenue intersection, or just a little before Hill Avenue intersection, down to about the Briarcliff uh, subdivision there at Briarcliff Road. And then the west end alternative is from Briarcliff up to uh, Illinois 25. And 
the two alternatives that we came up with were a four-lane cross-section, three-lane cross-section for the east end, and then five separate alternatives for that S-curve and on the west. Next, please. Again, this is, this is how we, this is kind of how we decide on what type of roadway to build. We gather these numbers and then there's criteria that we follow that is suggested by IDOT and we follow those numbers. Where those numbers lie is, is, is what's suggested for the design of the roadway. So with the numbers that we found, uh, we had the two options for three and four lane and then the, the five alternatives on the west end. Next, please. This is a visual of the four lane typical section. I think people are familiar with this. You've driven on it. Most people have driven on it once before. It's two lanes in, in either direction. Uh, curb and gutter on both sides to collect drainage and be a closed drainage system. A five foot pedestrian sidewalk on one side and a 10 foot bicycle mixed use, mixed use, use path on the right side, sorry. Um, next, please. And then this is a three lane section. This is two lanes in each direction and then you have your center two way left turn lane. Um, this was the preferred that came out of the, the, the first stake or the second stakeholder focus group meeting. So we went forward with this design and uh, laid out the design along the roadway. Um, and uh, that part of the process is, is finished and we will further that design to the end of phase one. I have a question. Yes. Um, the, in the second focus group, you're saying the three lane was, was, was preferred. chosen, preferred over the four lane? That, okay. Thank you. And again, we just, we asked for opinion and comment. In the end, it's going to be, what, what our job is, a, as a, what our job is as consultants, we're, we're supposed to give a recommendation to the county. And then the county will, will go forward with that recommendation. Uh, and that's, we can come back to what I said at the very beginning is that a portion of this project we felt that we needed more community involvement to decide on, on what to do. Uh, we saw either one being uh, you know, a 50-50 split. So we'd rather get a local opinion and comment to move forward. Next, please. So as I just said, the, the, the stakeholder focus group, we presented the three and the four lane, and then in the second uh, uh, group meeting, we, the three lane was preferred and selected and, and moved forward. Um, the three lane, ultimately, there's a the width restriction. It's a very narrow corridor. So a three lane provides uh, a narrow cro narrower cross section. So you're not impacting as many properties through the area as a four lane. And you also get the needed capacity for, for traffic. So you're, you're solving the, the original problem of traffic capacity and you're limiting the impacts to the local you know, properties and, and surrounding businesses. Next, please. This is the West End. So as I said before, the West End is, consists of just past Briarcliff to Illinois 25. This was our first alternative that we came up with. It's two roundabouts at either intersection. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's closest to what's there today um, that was selected to move forward. The roundabouts, the problem with the, the S-curve that we were finding from comment and public opinion and then crash histories that there were accidents along that curve. It was uh, insufficient vertical sight distance. Um, the horizontal was actually sufficient, but the speeding around that turn, and then as of today, there's guardrail, there's, there's signage mitigation for speed. What the traffic, what this uh, roundabout does is slow down traffic. It's, a, it's a tr mainly a traffic calming feature uh, along the roadway. Uh, next, please. The second alternative was a mini compact roundabout. This is, a, this is a roundabout in which there is no raised center island. It is just a painted circle to direct traffic in the direction of the roundabout. Um, this also is a traffic calming measure that would reduce speed and, and provide a little bit more safety. This one was dismissed in the second stakeholder focus group meeting. Um, the group felt that it was just, it just wouldn't provide the, the necessary traffic calming. It just came down to people, people felt that no one would abide by the, uh, the traffic circle operations or roundabout operations. Next, please. 
Uh, alternative three, this is a realignment. Uh, so we would take Montgomery Road and realign through uh, the properties and connect to uh, the end of Montgomery Road there where we tie into Illinois 25. To provide access to the local properties on the existing Montgomery Road, we would call to sac each end and provide a, con a connecting street through one of the properties there. Uh, this alternative was uh, preferred or selected, I should say, and pushed forward. So alternative one and three were ultimately pushed forward for more analysis and decision. Uh, next, please. Alternative four, this was, this was one of the options that was created in the stakeholder focus group meeting. We had a workshop in the first meeting uh, to gather people's opinions on what, how they felt we could maybe design something new, something out of the box, something different that we didn't see, that we, we couldn't come up with. And this was one of the options. Uh, this one has a roundabout uh, along Montgomery Road and then cul-de-sacs the existing while sending traffic out and around and through those properties to tie into uh, Illinois 25. This alternative was ultimately dismissed by the stakeholder focus group meeting. I think so. Um, I have uh, records of, of what they uh, actually uh, selected, reasons why it was dismissed, but to, to keep it short, they felt that the wayfinding with the roundabout would be too confusing for the public um, the amount of uh, impact to the properties would be just too much and when compared to the other alternatives it just didn't seem feasible. Next. This was the, the second alternative that came out of that stakeholder focus group meeting. Similar uh, to four uh, except the roundabout is moved to the west along the uh, vertical north-south uh, stretch. I think it was South Broadway or Montgomery Road. Same thing, realignment through the properties uh, and the same reasons. Uh, it, the wayfinding and, and confusing for the general public to commute through here and the intersection to the north uh, was just in, was too close in proximity. Next, please. So let's just recap uh, three and four. Three moved forward. It was selected as a, as a preferred. Um, as far as the West End alternatives, four and five came out of the stakeholder focus group. Uh, one, two, and three are presented at the stakeholder focus group, and one and three move forward, and that's where we are today. So we have one and three for the alternatives on the West End. These are very, uh, each has its own unique uh, ways of solving a problem, and uh, each one has its own impacts. And that's kind of where we are today. We want to get the opinion of the village and move forward and then ultimately we will select which one we feel uh, fits the, the community and then further the design into phase two. And then that will be our recommendation to the county and we'll go for uh, design approval from IDOT and FHWA. Next. When you say your problem, what do you as a consultant see the problem is? I, I'm not, if, did you do traffic counts? Yes. You must have. Then you must know that most of the traffic stop at Douglas, mm -hmm. right? Well, uh, we don't and most of your tie-ups, and I, I think this probably is the Jennifer, is down by the bowling alley where Hill Avenue State Highway hits that. If you don't improve that whole intersection, this ain't going to make a difference. It'd be like Route 30 and Orchard is right now. You have no turns because the state won't go past that. This is the same situation on. Eight or eight, seven, eight o'clock, noon or five, everything piles up both ends, all four ends, at right. that intersection. But you get to Doug, you get to Montgomery Road and Douglas. After after that, there's no. I don't, I don't know if you have that much traffic count. True. There, the numbers are are significantly lower. Lower. On the rest end right. Uh, that's why there is option to minimize some of those West End alternatives, but still keeping them in their main operations. So, uh, it just seemed if I sat, if I sat on the Kangani board and seen all the money projected that side of Douglas, where there's no, as you say, problems, there is not that many problems. Your problems are the other end, and it's Hill Avenue. There's no doubt about it. Those people will 
uh, I don't know how many cars, what the count, count is there, but it's just the, the delays are so long, it's unbelievable. I mean, that's where I get all the, the residents hitting me is like, what are you going to do with those stoplights there? Are they, who controls them? I go, not us. <laughs> you know, so. On, on Hill Avenue, that, that intersection will be upgraded. That is part of the, of the project. All four. In other words, the state's going to come in with you guys. So what, what we have done is we have, we've analyzed that intersection and, and the traffic counts uh, for that intersection, and then we design out to, to 2040, and we decide uh, what does the roadway need to be uh, built to in order to accommodate that traffic. So we've designed that to IDOT standards, and what we have to do is seek their approval. So when, when we design, we will send them information in our design so that they can review comment and, and respond, and then we'll, that's the, the reason why we want to get IDOT approval, and then they will, they will be involved in the funding and the process for rebuilding that roadway. Is Aurora involved in this too, or? In other words, if you look, if you go by the traffic patterns, Farnsworth, everybody comes down Farnsworth all the way, and then they're stuck there with a stop sign. I, Nobody goes up Hill Avenue, hardly at all, unless they're trying to get around that Farnsworth conglomerate. But if you've got a stoplight at it there and you make that intersection better and this intersection at Hill, that solves, your, as you say, problems, but it seems like you've got a lot of alternatives on that side of, of Douglas, which is not, I don't know if that's a big problem anymore because of the way the traffic patterns are now. Yeah, I just did want to clarify that we are improving the intersection at Hill, we're improving the intersection at Douglas, and we're improving the intersection at 25 as part of this project. So those intersections will be improved. We've already begun intersection design and coordination with Village of Montgomery on the roads that we intersect with them, and also with IDOT on the roads that we intersect with them. And um, we probably didn't go into very much detail on those intersections here tonight because there are no design alternative decisions to make. So, but those intersections will be improved as part of this project. Okay, thank you. Just to comment on your City of Aurora question and coordination, we did briefly coordinate with them at the beginning of the project. We will ultimately coordinate with them throughout the ongoing process. Um, I'm, I cannot recall who I spoke to over there, but they said they were looking at the Farnsworth Avenue intersection as a project. And we'll coordinate so that we can accommodate that on the east end of our project the best we can. Um, ultimately, the come timing and funding will come into play at some point. So we will we will coordinate with them um, on and find out what they are doing. We will uh, provide information to them for their project also. So. Okay. Certainly, they're considered one of our stakeholders on this project. Yeah. Uh, so m moving forward, just to, just to wrap this up, uh, the potential process if we can get to a preferred alternative, um, <clears throat> our next big step is to get IDOT to review uh, certain parts of the project. Then it moves towards uh, park district coordination. There are numerous parks through the area that we're impacting. We need to get approval from them also. Uh, then we move to an FHWA meeting, and then once we have approval from them, we can move to a public hearing, gather more public comments on the, on the phase one completed design and then uh, uh, finish the, the, the project development report and seek design approval from IDOT and FHWA and then hopefully move to phase two in 2016. Uh, oh. Next, I think that, that may be it. Uh, <clears throat> yes, that's it. Um, that's pretty much, uh, that's it uh, briefly. Um, there's, a, there's been a lot of work on this project. We've, we've been on it for some time. Um, we want to make sure that we, uh, we accommodate and, and include as many people from the public and the communities as we can. Uh, that's kind of why we took this approach, this, this concept, context sensitive solutions approach. Um, we, we ultimately, we don't, we're not, we don't have to follow that approach, but we've, we just felt that it was necessary to include the, the right amount of public involvement in this project. I have a question, <clears throat> and alternative, <clears throat> alternative three, how many properties are impacted? Were the residents of those properties included in this yes. process? Yes. Um, can I leave the podium? Is that? No, you get shocked. No. <laughs>
the, the items that came out of those, those, those public meetings? Hey, Dale, do you want to bring down the wireless mic for him? Just so that. These are some of the things that came out of that public meeting in the stakeholder focus group meeting. We make this matrix, and then we, we analyze them uh, to, as sort of metrics to, to, to compare the different alternatives. We, uh, we compare them uh, using these metrics that, we, that come from those meetings. So it's a way of kind of making, it's a way of making a decision. What, who do we impact? What do we impact? How many, uh, how much right of way, wetland, parking, all of this. And I believe, I don't know it offhand, how many properties are, are impacted, but you're asking alternative three? Yes. For alternative three, <coughs> No, I do, I, I'm, were those property owners a part of this process before they find out that they're going to lose their property? Yes, sir. I'd have to go back and look at who was the, attending the stakeholder focus group meeting. Yeah, they were certainly invited to the stakeholder focus group okay. meeting. So. Yeah, but on alternative three, there's a guy that's losing his house. <laughs> I, I think, Doug, that was probably more accurately your question is how many houses are being lost because some of that's open space land and, and that. Most but, of it is. And certainly a concern that, and I'm guessing this is an eminent domain situation where they're not going to have much of a choice. Um, we're at a point now where uh, it is hard to say exactly who will lose their property, and it is. Um, so we look down the road at the eventual construction of this project. We don't see that happening for many years still. So. Um, it's it's some it's hard to talk about right now, and it certainly is an emotional topic for sure. Um, yeah, that is definitely the goal. Okay, and that, uh, it's hard for me to make the decision about which alternative to use without knowing how many people we're going to impact. I have a follow-on question as well. What would become of the existing road under Alternative 3? How would that be handled? There are some homes that would be impacted by that decision as well? Yes. How would they achieve ingress and egress then? The, this, this connection, as you can see right here in the center, it's a little bit shaded around it, but the, the connection in the center is how the properties would access Montgomery Road as they do, as they do today, and, and funnel through this area where this connection is, and then that would lead them to the new proposed Montgomery Road. Would the utilities along that road be relocated then? We would do utility coordination uh, with the utility companies, but as of right now, we don't have the plan. We have to look at problems with this. And we would, we would accommodate whatever was left of properties. Uh, so would, they would coordinate with us and they would relocate upon what the, the ultimate the branch of road that uh, forms the left leg of the shoe looks like Italy to me. Uh, what purpose does that serve? Is that for access to Montgomery Road? This, in the center here? 
Yes, sir. Yes, that, so, so when we realign the roadway, you're, you're taking, providing those cul-de-sacs, you're taking away access to the main Montgomery Road. So the connection basically runs on the other side. <laughs> so this connection gives them access to the new Montgomery Road, the proposed Montgomery Road. Um, eliminating this intersection because you have this intersection of proximity, simplifying the geometry, Doesn't it isn't uh, uh, to have this intersection and this intersection in connection? It doesn't really fall on the lines of, of purpose, uh, op purposeful operation of the roadway. Um, closing this off and creating one focal point for access just improve the will improve the operations of the road. Now, these are these are small design changes that can be looked at and can be changed. Like I said, we, we design, we try to minimize as, as much impacts as we can, but we also try to keep a, a bit of a buffer so that we can minimize some more. We, wanna, we don't want to come here and say, yes, you can build it and not touch anything whatsoever. I mean, that's, I mean, we all want that to happen. But, um, well, where that? The, the extension that we're discussing, um, yeah. what exists there now? Uh, I believe this is a property right here, and a property right here. There's a residence here, a house, and a house here. And then I think that this is all open land. So part of the, the property is here. Okay. Jordan, the parcels adjacent to Austin Park up there where there's blue what I would call caps at the end. Mm -hmm. So those roadways are no longer going to connect to Montgomery Road? In, in order to connect, they're going to have to go down? No, the, so these properties here you're asking? Yes. They have access to Montgomery Road? Those streets, yeah, because those are streets. Those are driveways. They're driveways. Oh, they're driveways. These are just entrances to these properties, and they'll just be, they'll just be rebuilt as <coughs> the Again, here we're trying to limit as much impact as possible to the park and the property. As I look at alternative number three, and we talk about impact on properties, I'm more apt to, to go with alternative one. It impacts more properties, but it doesn't impact them as much. Uh, alternative three, I see one, two, at least three homes that are essentially no longer there. And, and eminent domain or not, I'd, I'm not going to vote for an alternative that's going to put someone out of their home. I think as we, as we calculate, just according to the, our, the matrix that we had at the time, we had nine residential parcels that were impacted. Now, impacted doesn't mean completely taken away. It just means they're affected by the, the, the sun rays or the wind or the road obstacles in front of the uh, property that you come to or that you need to the entire property. So uh, one, Right. And three goes through large swaths of driveway that they're concentrating and covering. So, uh, again, I'm not here to I'm not here to sway you either, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I'm here to get your opinions, you know, and I just want to provide as much as <coughs> as we can so we can make a, a comment or a, an opinion. Also, though, if, if speed is a concern, alternative three, I can zip down alternative three and never slow down. Um, alternative one, as I navigate those roundabouts, I have to slow down. Because in alternative one, those are raised roundabouts, correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. Have you... Tight 
radius here is what's being used. So this becomes more of a residential roadway. And then traffic mainly goes through here. Now there's no problem here with going at the posted speed. Now I can't, you know, you might slow down, but if they go at the posted speed, this is this design is sufficient for uh, design speed of five miles an hour more than the posted speed. Chief, posted speed is what, 35? 30? 30? You show no wetlands on this map, and where you have Montgomery Road and Broadway hit up at there, that first house right down below it, uh, yeah, on the other side, if you go there probably now, well, he's cutting his grass today and he was having a heck of a time. Usually right where your red dot is right now is underwater all the time, and I don't know how you couldn't call that a wetlands. That thing is, every, any heavy rain and you've got to just, water sitting all over that and it has to be a wetlands. This is a, there's a, it's very hard to clean here and I apologize, but there is a, a flood plain here from the FEMA, I believe it's a FEMA map that we put up here. So this will bisect that flood plain. So in order to take care of the drainage, and I'm not an expert on the drainage side of things, but we have drainage engineers that will investigate and, and, and figure out what's needed for each alternative. Mm -hmm. But in this situation, uh, there would need to be storage for this Right, because there's no homes behind there. It's just that at that corner, there's one house that would be affected probably. And like I say, if, if King County gives them a good dollar for that wetlands, I don't think he'd have a problem. And if you move it on the other side so that the neighbors up above don't get it, you might have a better plan. Yeah, there's, yeah, so just like Jordan said, we're, uh, alternative three creates an alignment going straight through the floodplain there. So. There are some challenges with that alignment, but then again, part of the whole purpose of this project is to alleviate some of the flooding and standing water that we have along oh. this roadway frequently. Do you have projected costs for either of these two? We do. And I'm assuming that one of them, it costs a lot more than the other one? It does, yes. Okay. <laughs> it does. Right. No, that's fine. Um, one technical question that I was going to ask is, the, do we have a lot of accidents on the S-curve currently that would justify either one of these alternatives, which is a pretty substantial change in that area? Uh, during uh, dry weather, uh, we don't. But when it's raining and during winter, mm -hmm. we do. Okay. Those roundabouts cause, I would consider snow plowing. Roundabouts would considerably impact plowing and cleanup. Yes, yeah, we've got um, a couple of roundabouts in Kane County under design right now, and we actually drew a roundabout <coughs> in our parking lot with traffic cones to kind of prove to our maintenance staff that yes, you can get the snow plow around the roundabout, the circumference of the roundabout, and um, they've tried it out. We've got them on board. They're, they're okay with it. But yes, snow plowing, um, landscaping, maintenance has been considered for sure on the design. Do you have a roundabout now up like in Carpentersville or somewhere? Yeah, there are a few roundabouts up in Lake County. I, and um, of course, Wisconsin's got a bunch of really well working. I've, I have just got back this weekend from Wisconsin. They have two roundabouts and they're right, boom, boom. They're great for traffic okay. if you know where you're going. Okay. Yeah. 
If not, it's like that uh, Lampoon's vacation where the guy just keeps going around trying to figure out how, what streets what. I mean, it's really a, and is King County going to keep this road done instead of us? Uh, that's a good question. I think that's on the table for discussion uh -huh. is a jurisdictional transfer. In other words, if you keep it, we don't worry about the snow plowing around yeah. there. Okay. I had a question about semi trucks in the roundabout scenario. Uh, is that part of the design criteria? It is. Yeah, we usually use a wheelbase 65. Sometimes we use the wheelbase 67. Also, a lot of the roundabouts are designed with what they call a truck apron with a mountable curb, so that the trucks, the roundabout is designed for over tracking by larger vehicles, and the trucks are used to kind of mounting some of these three inch mountable curbs with a truck apron to protect landscaping design. We even actually ran a combine pulling a trailer uh, in the computer auto turn program to prove to a farmer that he could get his combine around one of these things mm -hmm. and he seemed satisfied with that, so. Which one of these is safer, one or three? Are they? Good question. Okay. The roundabout uh, situation takes an existing uh, problematic area and calms traffic. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that, whether that makes things safer there, um, if someone hit their, their speed going through that, I can't imagine. Right. But it does. I mean, you, the roundabout forces you to make a maneuver in which you will have to slow. Mm -hmm. If you do not slow down, you will go over the middle of the roundabout. Mm -hmm. Roundabouts will all have a what road it is. It'll also say maybe going to what highway. It'll also say yield. Everybody will have a yield. Well, we found out real quick that the Wisconsin people all understand what yield is. But once you see Illinois people in there, it was like, look out. I mean, they were just <laughs> tearing through. It was just comical really yeah. but like you say you can people go up on the on the top of the roundabout they go down on the bottom of the roundabout it was just kind of a there is some driver conditioning yes very much so yeah you get uh, Yeah, that's, I was just going to mention the same thing with all of the learning we've been doing in King County with the roundabouts that we've been discussing it, is that the uh, collisions do tend to be less severe in a roundabout because you are, it's, it is more of a side swipe type You're collision. You're definitely going slower, a, but you have to get the people to get laminated to yeah, it eventually. Typically, you're entering the roundabout at about, at about 20 miles per hour, so it really reduces the speeds through there. It gives people time to make a decision. Yep. Any other comments from the board? I think what we'd like to do is, if you have comments, to make them tonight publicly when the staff is here. But what we would do is um, con um, 
put our comments together in a letter back to you guys so we can kind of chew on this a little bit. This is a pretty, I'm, I'm sure that it's needed and a drastic change to that area that, you know, I'm certain that'll be a ton of questions, but if this is a 20 year down the road plan, I mean, it makes sense to get a, pre a preferred alternative on the books now so that property owners in, in that area can plan for that. But ultimately what Kane County is trying to do and what we're trying to do is improve the situation of that road. And if that impacts some houses, then that's uh, a decision that we're in the county going to have to make. Yeah, it is, it is kind of a long process. So we're finishing up, phase, well, we're nearing the end of phase one here and then um, it will be some time before we enter, you know, we don't expect to enter phase two engineering for at least a year. Beyond that, uh, we have to complete phase one to start looking for funding to build the project. So that's multiple years out. And then I imagine a project as large as this will be built in phases, probably starting from the easier end of the project, working its way west. So that adds even more years to when something might actually happen in this area so that it does it's a long process so to get it started now and once you finish this phase one would you be able to chunk out like the intersections like you were saying that we currently do have problems at and do some of those sooner or uh, if if it works out we, we have to look at it from an operational standpoint mm -hmm. just putting it in and looking at solving operational right Since I have you here, um, and you say it's long term, I hope that that Hill Avenue and Route 30 is not long term because that I think will solve a lot of your problems on Montgomery Road because people are they get backed up all the way past the swimming pool on, on stoplights, and that is not going to wait for a long time to solve. And I don't think. I mean, that's our biggest. No, that's complaint to people all the time is what about those stoplights it just they're not synchronized right and it seems like with traffic and it's just a mess there I think you can go out there and sit in a corner and see that real quick that oh, yeah. it's a mess yeah. okay. I have a, since you're here Jennifer mm -hmm. who and somebody may know the answer to this I just don't who controls the traffic control at Orchard and 30 oh. is that state county Orchard is our road. State. Is IDOT. Okay. Candle County. Okay. To answer your question, the state uh, controls all four. Okay. So if we have an issue with that, we call the state, which in case um, Mead Electric, I believe, Mead comes out. Yeah, Mead comes out and handles all four. Okay, thank you. How about Hill Avenue then, since we have, do you know Hill Avenue, if that's the state or county? Typically, Hill Avenue is an unmarked state route. Right. That's it. Because I, I feel by the residents, yep. that is the main concern with all of Montgomery Road is that corner. I mean, it's just, it's just a mess. Like I say, it, it in the morning, noon, and night, it's just a mess. And it, and most of the traffic does stop at Douglas. They go that way, and most of the traffic there goes either straight or right. And uh, Farnsworth comes in with no light, and it's it's like a complicated mess. I'm sure there's more accidents there in the winter time at that stop 
like people running in the back end of people and there is on the curve. Well, we, we stop at Crown, right. um, okay. but we do go out and assist quite often. Uh, anything east of Crown is City of Aurora and at Hill and Montgomery Road, if, if the light, a traffic light goes out, then the City of Aurora Electrical Company or Electrical uh, Division will come out and fix those lights, all four intersections, okay. all four corners. We're kind of out of that, okay. Correct. But it impacts our town immensely, like you said, uh, goes all the way back to Park Drive. Yeah. Sorry, I was just looking at the weather. My wife just texted me to hurry home. Uh, there's a pretty decent storm coming this way. So if there's any more uh, comments from the board or from staff, we'll put those together in a, in a letter or response back to them. We'll probably discuss this at a future meeting as well. And thank you guys both for coming this evening. Yowza. What's that? That was item two. <laughs> yeah, I know. All right, moving on. Uh, item C, we have Chris Rowald, President of the Orchard Prairie North HOA regarding landscape removal and other um, landscape issues. And with that. I don't think the microphone's on. Try that. Is that better? Yep. Cool. Uh, my name is Chris Rowald. I'm the uh, president of the uh, Orchard Prairie North Homers Association. Um, we're coming here today to kind of get uh, some clarification on a couple items. The, the agenda had some things about landscaping removal. It's not exactly the, <clears throat> uh, doesn't really fit exactly what we're trying to describe here or what we're trying to ask about. but. Uh, essentially what we're trying to do is get some cl some clarification on the ownership of some of the center islands and entrances and cul-de-sacs that are within uh, the neighborhood. Uh, to kind of make sense why we're asking about this, I need to give you a, as brief of a, of a lead up to where we're at as possible. Um, so basically what happened in the fall of last year, um, a particular resident, some resident of our neighborhood uh, felt there was a safety issue with uh, the entrance to our subdivision at William Avenue, which is, or I'm sorry, William Drive, which is right here. Uh, this is Griffin, and Route 30 is up atop. So this is uh, William Drive here. Um, there's a cul-de-sac, or I'm sorry, there's a, a, a island, a landscaped island right here in, in the center, <clears throat> built by the uh, developer uh, when the neighborhood was constructed. And uh, it's mounded quite a bit. Uh, from from the curb, so it's about two two and a half feet, or was two two and a half feet tall, and then there was uh, shrubs and bushes on top of that. And actually, there were supposed to be trees, and they were always pruned to bushes, but nonetheless, there's shrubs and, and bushes on that island. And what was happening is is kids, in particular, were coming across uh, the intersection, and no one could see them until a car came up um, right at them at the end of the uh, the other side of the of the intersection, and there were some near misses. So. Uh, some, whoever it was contacted the village and said, hey, I think we have a problem. And uh, they came out and did a study. I think Mike Pubins, the uh, former uh, public works director, came out and did a study. Uh, felt that there was enough of an issue to warrant some sort of ac action about it. And uh, so what they felt the first action would be to do is to take and cut down the shrubs that were along this cul-de-sac, which were creating kind of like a hedgerow. Um, the HOA, we, we, they didn't come to us, we didn't hear anything about it. Uh, we just came home one day and bushes are gone. And so we contacted the village and said, hey, what happened here? Um, what's going on? And um, we learned about the, the safety issue that apparently somebody was, some, somebody was dealing with. So our, our question then was, okay, that, that, that's fine, that, that happens. Um, is there a reason why no one told us? I mean, we, we take care of those spaces. Um, what happened? And so we sat down with, with Mike Pubins and he said, I really apologize. We just went out trying to figure out exactly what the, the quickest and easiest solution would be, like the, 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 the most cost effective solution would be, and our, our, our simplest thing would be to, well, let's just take down the bushes and see how that goes. 
We didn't think about talking to the HOA. It was just one of those oversight things. We apologize. Of course, we're going to, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll fix it. Um, we'll fix uh, the situation of some sort because now, unfortunately, it's just kind of a, a dirt mound. It looks kind of, looks kind of junky. So, um, so in that meeting with with Mike, we had kind of an amicable situation where the real solution needed to be that the mound needed to be taken down because whatever grows back again, or we put back in place to beautify it again, is going to recreate that hedgerow again, that wall that's going to be hard to see. And really, what needed to happen is the two two and a half foot mound of dirt needed to come down to to, to curb level. So that was agreed upon. Sure, we'll do that. This, this was all happening in, in the winter. Uh, he said, of course, we can't do this until the spring. Um, spring came. Uh, unfortunately, Mike resigned and left. And so it was kind of like, you know, how's this going to work out? They started the work um, a month and a half ago or so on the William Drive entrance. Part of the original conversation was to also deal with Kate, which is up here. It has exactly the same island, has exactly the same planting. It's designed exactly the same way wasn't brought to attention that there was an issue. However, I think it's because there's very few children that live in that cul-de-sac and there's just less activity at the moment on that side. But Mike also agreed that we would, obviously we want to make the, the two islands match. You know, we don't want to have one look one way and the other look a different way. Um, so both work was going to get done. So uh, about a month and a half ago, William Drive got, got taken care of. But on the day it was being done, I happened to talk to uh, the Village Public Works uh, gentleman who was out there, and he said, well, we have nothing going on for Kate. We are only supposed to do William. And so this kind of started a conversation about, okay, well, what happened? Did something th uh, slip through the cracks with Mike leaving? Um, let's figure this out. So many weeks went by. William was done. Kate never had any activity. We called the Village to say, hey, can we come to one of these board meetings and say, hey, does anybody know what's happening? What's the status? Where are we at? Uh, so that brings us to, to really what our situation is, is in that conversation with the, with the village representative, uh, it was brought up uh, in the conversation that, and, and I'm going to paraphrase, that the islands are the city's property, and so it'll get taken care of. I'm sure it'll be done, no big deal, you know, it'll be all right. And we responded with, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's our property, and we, we take care of it. There's things in our covenants to talk about how to take care of it and what we should do with it, and it was kind of a back and forth. and. Um, Last week, they called back and said, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely uh, the city property. So our point for this evening is trying to get some clarification on who technically owns these cul-de-sac, or these, uh, these islands, as well as uh, common spaces that are in each one of these cul-de-sacs, which are here, uh, up here, uh, up in Sand Hill Court, which is here, William Court, and Kate Court. So not only the islands in the entrances, but also each one of the cul-de-sacs, and there's actually a, a center island along William Drive as well. So um, if in the event that the, uh, the city does own these things, um, we've been paying insurance on them. We've been planting plants that have died and replaced things. We've actually been pumping a decent amount of money into these particular <coughs> areas. If they're not ours, okay, how is this supposed to work? Who's supposed to take care of them? Unfortunately, some of the covenants and bylaws does reflect that we're supposed to replace things and upgrade them over time and things like that. So I'm not sure where we stand on who's supposed to have what, you know, and if there is some sort of documentation that the city owns it, okay, great, then we need to pull ourselves away from taking care of it. If it's not and we're supposed to take care of it, we need to make sure that we have our things in place and just make sure everybody's on, on the same page. So, um, so that's what... We're here to, you know, obviously no one, I understand no one's going to actually pull out any documentation and go, here, here it is, but uh, we kind of need to know, you know, what's the status of these areas. Um, if the village does own it, we need to know things like, all right, so now that they've been torn up, what's the village's plan to finish them off? Because now they're going to be, they're going to be graded, so the safety issue is gone, but now there's going to be dirt pits. So we actually had a, a landscape plan. It was like going to be like a multi-phase situation over the few years as we get funding <clears throat> to finish the landscaping. We already did the section up by the monuments where there's a sign that you know, denotes the, the neighborhood um, that we did a few years ago when we were going to phase the rest of it out. So we already have a plan, but obviously we're not going to put ten dollars to $15,000 onto a piece of property that we don't own. <clears throat> but at the same time, it, it's now dirt. So how is that going to get taken care of? Um, is there a long-term plan from the village as to what happens as plants die, as they age out? Um, as things get damaged to, for wind or weather or whatever the situation will be, 
we've been doing it so far. So um, how is that supposed to work going forward? Is, is there some concerted effort? If it's not just the islands and it's all the cul-de-sacs, those aren't being taken care of either, and we're not really paying attention to it just because of the funding we have. So they're kind of sketchy on to, uh, as to how well they're being maintained. Uh, so if those are villages as well, along with the islands, that all needs to be coordinated and, and somehow taken care of. Um, well, I know we have an SSA tax to mow the common areas and you know, take care of those sort of things. So is that then a question mark as to how much our SSA tax, are they already supposed to be covering the islands and the cul-de-sacs? Is it just the perimeter? Um, there is a, there's lot numbers for the, the perimeter. There's a berm here and a long 30, and then there's a section right here that goes to a sidewalk that goes across uh, the creek. Uh, those are designated as homeowners association property, um, and the village mows those and you know, pretty much just mows it. But uh, our SSA tax is, is covering the maintenance of these things. Um, if these aren't ours, which the city mows right now and sort of takes care of, are we, should our tax be different? Or is that matrix, however they figure out that dollar figure, is, is that included in those things? Maybe they are, maybe they are, I, I don't know, but it's all <coughs> kind of convoluted at the moment as to who's supposed to have what. So um, the other question mark is up to this point, we've been assuming we're taking care of those signs and those entrances. There's a, there's a stone monument that has, has the name of the subdivision. If someone were to be out of control with their car and crashes into that and destroys that, who's putting that back together? If a kid's climbing on it and it's a loose brick and they fall and split their head open or break their arm and they come to us and go, hey, your sign, you know, hurt my kid, is it, do we say, hey, no, it's the villages, go talk to them about it. Like, where does those responsibilities lie? So that's kind of what we're looking for. Um, if there's any clarification as to uh, what these things are supposed to be. On this plat, which is what the village provided us, they're not even shown. There's, there, it just shows the street, and they're not even marked. There, there's no parcel number, there's no, um, there's no lot number. So under these things, the plat, they don't even exist. But obviously they do. So did they slip through the cracks between inland and the village? Um, are they you know, are, are they, do they have some sort of designation and there's some documentation that says these are owned by some party or another? Village, HOA, how does that work out? So that's what we're looking for, some, some sort of clarification. If anybody has some details on how this usually works in other, other subdivisions or whatever, we just need to know how that's shaking out. Thank you, Chris. Um, some of those are really awesome questions, actually. Uh, Rich wanted to... You have a couple of those that you can address. A couple of those we can address Real quick tonight. before you start. Um, we'll address a couple of them tonight, the ones that we know off the cuff. And then what we will do is re review our docs, your docs, really answer the questions very thoroughly so that you're very clear going forward, um, if that's okay with the board. Just, but anyway, go from there. We feel very confident that the, um, the area that was um, removed, the landscape material that was removed from that area as well as the, the other one that has not been removed are definitely part of the village right away and therefore owned by the village. As you identified, there's a couple other parcels that are actually owned by the HOA but maintained with uh, SSA funds by the village. So I think that partially answers some of your questions. In terms of uh, coming back in and planting, I think that we would want to go through your HOA docs, I believe that in those documentations it identifies the HOA as the maintenance component. So before the village went back in and looked at any type of planting material, I think it'd be appropriate for the village to sit down and meet with your HOA and go through that ultimate landscape design or redesign for those areas. Right, so as a clarification, so we, we know in our covenants and bylaws we have we have the control of lots 116, which is the berm along Griffin, uh, 117, which is the area between the neighborhood and Route 30, and 120, which is this little section over to the to the uh, to the bridge. So those, yeah, we're and we know that it actually specifically talks about those lots. Right. So the cul-de-sacs and the entrances, you're saying they're they're definitely village property. Right? Correct. So is the is the SSA tax which we've always assumed is to take care of the property that we own that needs to be managed by the city just because, you know, so make sure it doesn't 
fall into derelictness and things like that. That's, that tax is only technically for 116, 117, and 120. I can't answer that specifically okay. tonight. I don't know if it's intended to cover just those three properties that the HOA maintains control of or ownership of and the call to sacks or not. I don't know the answer to that tonight. We'd have to investigate that a little bit further. And we will. And that's a, honestly, that's a great question uh, to clarify that. If well, I, I may, uh, Mr. Mayor, before we go any further, just for transparency purposes and to make sure, question for Attorney Anderson. If some of us live in this subdivision, can we take place in this conversation or should we? The, okay. This is not the sort of thing where, where I think that there's any sort of a conflict or even, or even the appearance of impropriety. So okay. I, I think that you can fully participate. Okay. Sorry, I, Matt. No, I, Thank you. I live in Lakewood Creek nearby, and I know that all of our common area, all of our right of way, we have boulevard type entrance way that is owned by the village and maintained by the HOA. All of those common, all of that area is maintained by the HOA, but it's owned. It's kind of like the right of way in front of your house, you know, that the easement in front of your house, you mow it, the village plants the trees, the village asks that you prune the trees, but ultimately that's the village property. So it's kind of the same situation at Noah and Lakewood Creek that that's the way ours is set up, is that the HOA maintains them because they maintain them much better than the village would be able to as far as timeliness of mowing and things like that. Yeah, and, and so and that was kind of one of our confusions is that because we don't mow it, we, you know, the, the village crew that, you know, takes they come out and they, you know, they cut down the dead things at the end of the season and things like that. So we just assumed, yeah, yeah, we own it. We owe it just, or we own it just like these other lots around, but they have, you know, the city comes in and maintains it. So um, if, if it's not, if it's not the HOAs, which, you know, if, let's assume it for the second that all that's the same between yours and ours, which it probably is. Um, it, it's, it's hard for us as the HOA to think that we should drop, you know, and I, obviously it's our decision, but thousands of dollars on, on a maintenance or a, a landscaping plan to beautify it if, if in theory, the village could come in at some other point and say, ah, oh, we're gonna do something different or, you know, we're gonna asphalt it. I know you wouldn't, but you know, the theory mm -hmm. is the options there for, you know, the next day for something to be a completely different ball game. And so before we would go and do any more work on something, we wanted to make sure that, you know, if whatever the ownership is, that it's all clear and whatever the expectations now that they've been taken out, how is this going to be put back together? Mm -hmm. so. Okay. All right, with that, we will get answers to the rest of your questions and um, circulate those to the board as well as, as you, and we'll certainly meet with you guys to figure this out. Um, full disclosure, I do live in that subdivision there, so um, I'm very aware of the situation. But thank you, Chris. All right, I'm going to move quickly here. Uh, consent agenda, items A through F. I can read those if you like. They're on the screen. I usually read them, but uh, we've talked about all of them previously, I believe. Um, is there motion. a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. Move and second. Call the roll, please. Second. Make Trustee Marisak, second by Trustee Lee. So, Trustee Marisek? Yes. Trustee Bond? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Hines? Yay. Trustee Youngerman? Yay. That carries 6 0. Thank you. Items for separate action we have resolution 2015 006, authorizing application for Kane County Riverboat funds and execution of all necessary documents. With that, I'll ask uh, Director Young for a summary. Uh, thank you. This is a um, joint application for a grant program through the Kane County Riverboat um, Fund. This is with the Fairfield Way subdivision um, to provide um, educational directional signs within their common open areas uh, for educational purposes. The intent is to have groups, school, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, other groups uh, utilize the naturalized areas as a outdoor classroom. So with that, um, there has been an application made to Kane County for riverboat funds. Um, in the amount of $12,000. There would be some like-kind funds uh, from the village, a contribution of about $1,200, uh, primarily through the Public Works Department through uh, staff time. And then the uh, Fairfield Way HOA uh, would provide $500 uh, 
as a matching portion of this grant application. So we need uh, endorsement by the village board to move forward with this app. I may be mixing this up with one of the other HOAs, but I was under the impression Fairfield Way HOA dissolved and then donated the money they had into the tree fund. Am I mixing them up with somebody else? Am I mixing them up with Foxmore? The HOA needed to be reactivated to recover the funds. And um, while it will eventually go away again, it still exists at the moment. And, and that purpose for existence is the proper distribution and use of those funds. Okay, but they were the ones that also yes. donated for the trees, correct? Well, it was more than trees. There, there were a variety of, uh, the, the residents were allowed to vote. And the, the winning ideas within that vote were multiple. And so there are several initiatives. But trees were one of them, absolutely. Thank you. There's no other comments? Or? I would move to approve. Second. Moved and second by Trustee Youngerman. Call the roll, please. Trustee Bond? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Hines? Yay. Trustee Youngerman? Yay. Trustee Marisek? Yes. <coughs> Carry 6 0. Thank you. Item B, Resolution 2015-008, approving the uh, Concord Drive LAFO S STP application. And with that, I'll turn it over to Engineer Wallers. Thank you, Mayor. So as you know, from time to time, we try to access uh, funding for our routes in the village that are designated as FAU routes so that we can use federal money to resurface or rebuild our roadways. Um, the Kane Kendall Council Mayor now requires a uh, resolution of support from the local agency indicating that they will fund the project when the project comes back for consideration. Uh, we estimate this project will be out somewhere around 2020, so we're just planning ahead. Uh, it's Concord Drive, the entire length, so it is a village roadway. Uh, absent the use of federal funds, we'd have to use local funds, so this is a way that we can stretch our dollar to make it go a little further. So this is a new requirement. Uh, we've done many LAFO projects in the past and not had to uh, provide a resolution of support, but the county, uh, King County Council Mayors has changed their policy, so it's now uh, will be the routine. So staff recommends approval of the resolution and uh, we'll program that as you know time goes on, but uh, this is to commit uh, for funding. Okay. Any questions? That mean in 2019 we're going to come have to have 52,000 in our budget. Is that correct? According to this. Yeah, I mean that's the estimate. Sometimes these projects do get moved up, but right now it's programmed for engineering in 2019 and then construction in 2020. Okay, thank you. Which could be, and I mean Concord Drive is for those of you that aren't out on the west side, it's very much like Briarcliff would be here. It's a pretty main thoroughfare. It's a wide road. It would be great to have some funding help with resurfacing that roadway. There is a lot of damage in a big pothole down by Galena at that entrance. I almost lost the front of my car the other day. <laughs> we'll handle, I mean, routine patching obviously will be done uh, as norm normally, but this again is for a future resurfacing project. I'll move to approve. Second. Roll call. Trustee Sperling. Yes. Trustee Lee. Yes. Trustee Hines. Yay. Trustee Youngerman. Yay. Trustee Marisek. Yes. Trustee Bond. Yes. Carry 6 0. Thank you. Item C uh, Caneland Community Unit School District number 302 request for an easement. And with that, I'll uh, ask Engineer Wallers for a summary of this one. So, Caneland School is wanting to construct a fiber optic uh, cable connection from McDowell School <coughs> to the Civic Center campus <coughs> into the Kane County fiber optic line. In order for them to get from McDowell uh, to the Civic Center campus, they need to cross through two parcels controlled by the village. One is the detention basin on the east side of Foxmoor, and the other one is our Civic Center campus. What we're, or what they're proposing or requesting is a five-foot permanent easement with a construction, temporary construction easement uh, to pass through those two areas. Um, and um, uh, it is uh, 
through areas that are generally either um, out of the way of other utilities or to the far property line where I think they'll be uh, out of the way for any future village improvement. And further, I'll just mention that in the easement grant uh, is a provision that if uh, there is a village improvement that requires them to move that cable, uh, it would be done so at the cost of the uh, school district. So staff is recommending approval of the easements. There's actually two easements, um, one, again, in Foxmoor and one on Civic Center campus. So I'd be happy to answer, answer any questions on that. A couple of questions. That, does that need to go underneath uh, streets to get to the school? Okay, good. And is there any discussion about how deep that line should be? Well, we, we would leave that to the uh, folks that are installing. With my understanding, it's nominally less than 30 inches, which I, I, is typical of phone lines, cable TV, things like that. That was actually my concern. I'm hoping it'll be deep enough to avoid someone with a shovel or a random, because the fiber is a little harder to locate, I think, than wire? Um, well, I can't speak to that precisely, but I mean, you would have, I mean, this is going to be in, in village controlled properties, um, and if there's a Julie call, then it would be a responsibility of that utility to locate, so that would be the school. Okay. Any other questions? Motion? So moved. Second, second by Trustee Youngerman, second by Trustee Marisek. Call the roll, please. Trustee Youngerman? Yes. Trustee Marisek? Yes. Trustee Bond? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Hines? Yay. That carries, thank you. We'll move on to item D this evening, which is the Village Administrator Employment Contract. Uh, just a brief summary of this. Uh, the contract with uh, our administrator expired, I believe, a week or two ago. It's something that the board had discussed in executive session um, a couple of times to come to a, uh, an extension of that contract. So if there's any questions that the board has on this, you've seen this a few times. Uh, if, if there are none, I would entertain a motion for approval for another so two-year extension. Moved by uh, Trustee Sperling, second by Trustee Marisek again. Call the roll, please. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Hines? Yay. Trustee Youngerman? Yay. Trustee Marisek? Yes. Trustee Bond? Yes. And that carries 6 0. Thank you. We don't have any items for discussion. Uh, new or unfinished business? I have two items. The Rotary Club is officially chartered. We received our charter, I think it was last week. So we're official now. So that's great news for us. The other item I have is a public works item. I was on Gordon over the weekend, and the trees are kind of coming out over the speed limit sign. So if we can put that on their list to trim them back, I'd appreciate it. On what street? Uh, Gordon. Thank you. It's on the north side. Yeah. I have one item. Yes. Um, in the mail recently, I received uh, something about electrical aggregation that had the village logo on it as well. Um, I'm just curious, I know that our electrical aggregation, when compared to ComEd, is it still slightly cheaper? I, I thought that they were coming more in line with each other, uh, if I remember my presentations correctly. They are coming more in line with each other. Uh, the current uh, rate for ComEd right now is 7.13 and our new rate will be 6.82 um, as opposed to a number of years ago when aggregation first started where ComEd was around 8 and we were at 4.82 so okay. they are much closer than they used to be. Okay, thank you. I, I couldn't remember what they were. I wasn't sure if ComEd was slightly lower than what we were so okay. It yeah. was in one of the papers this weekend here, the beacon of the ledger where they showed all the villages that did that and I knew we were in the sixes, and there's a lot of them that are seven, eight, seven, six. They're higher than ComEd, so it just happened that we hit a good 
and most, a lot of them went out to 219, which I just couldn't believe somebody would sign up for like a five year, but uh, I think Justin did a good job with for us because ours is still lower. Okay. Stan? Two items I have, and I think the village may have as well, received some comments about interruptions to electrical service. So I, Nobody did call today. I must have had three or four emails over the weekend. The I'm sorry, interruptions in what? Electrical service uh, coming and going or just being completely out. So, and it did not affect, it apparently largely affected parts of Orchard Prairie North and parts of Foxmoor. Like but, but it, it was, was our Reagan house. Law. So, um, I, uh, while the people that reached out to me, I said, you need to contact Commonwealth Edison. It wouldn't hurt if the village maybe pursued that and provided an answer as to what caused that and what's being done about it. My wife called. Uh, it was out for about 10 minutes, um, but ComEd had already said something to the effect of there was an outage of about 1,700 homes. But it, it was over in about 10 minutes. Yeah, by it the time I looked, once. it was off there. They have an app. By the time I looked, it was off. So. Uh, but we can certainly find out what happened. If sure. I, the, the, at least one of the comments I got said it had happened for several days. I think it, so Doug's nodding his head too. It was three more days. than an yeah. isolated incident. Three, three days in a row it happened. And the, I think Sunday was the 10, nope, 10 to 15 minute outage. The other ones, it flickered several times throughout the weekend, Friday, Saturday. I, uh, as an add-on to that, I, it's my understanding that the new aggregating company, or in the old one for that matter, had nothing to do with those outages. It's not their responsibility and it's not their equipment, just to clarify that. But Debbie will jump right on that. <laughs> <laughs> I did forward the question to Sylvia Rogowski today, who's our ComEd rep. Okay. So. And the other more cheerful comment was the Beautification Committee performed their floral bed awards judging uh, this past Wednesday, and we recognized 18 properties in the village for outstanding landscaping and uh, accomplishment. Made some awesome. people happy. And I noticed, thank you, recognized Lakewood Creek Clubhouse it, as yes. well was on the list. I saw that in the Facebook. Very awesome. I have one more, Matt. Sorry. I forgot about this one. That's your second time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Check. Oh, you get. The, uh, I think most of us received uh, notification from the Oswego Fire Protection District that their ISO rating improved to a class two rating. And that yeah. is pretty significant because less than 2.1% of all fire departments across the United States have reached the status or higher. And the Oswego Fire Protection District is now rated at the same level as Aurora and Naperville Fire Departments. The ISO ratings Basically, why the residents should care about that is that it affects your insurance premiums. And the better the rating, the lower your premium. So I just wanted to mention that. That was, uh, I think I saw that in the paper too, but I heard from one of the trustees about that as well. Very awesome. Thank you. I'm going to move on quickly. Uh, future meetings, you can see them there. Executive session, uh, we are going to postpone that to the next meeting. And with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Oh, sorry. Pete. Adjourn. Go ahead, move. Pete. Yes, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second by Trustee Youngerman. Call the roll, please. Trustee Hines. Sorry. Trustee Youngerman. Hines. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Trustee Youngerman. Grace. Yes. Trustee yes. Trustee Bond. Yes. Trustee Sperling. Yes. Trustee Lee. Yes. And we're adjourned. Thank you. We need to tell Debbie to turn her mic on. You can't hear her. Give me. Give me